In this brief tutorial, we're going to look at how to work with Substance Designer um, and how it is used with other applications. Much of what we're doing here is actually a simplified version of Wes McDermott's excellent series on getting started with Substance Designer. Um, but these are just a, this is a slightly simpler uh, approach. Maybe we're not looking at all the different nodes that are available here, but uh, it'll get us started. Now, the first thing that I want to do is actually not talk about Substance Designer, uh, but talk about Substance Painter. Now the reason for that is is that Substance Painter is oftentimes where people get started with Substance products uh, and they have gotten used to somewhere along the line either painting with materials or smart materials um, down here on the bottom uh, that they've either painted onto their character or used with uh, fill layers or other sorts of things. Um, what these materials are is these are all substances. These are procedurally based um, materials, textures that can be used uh, in any sort of ways. So for instance uh, in Unity uh, these particular materials can be brought in uh, and used um, with the different uh, specifications that are set up for those procedural textures. So for instance uh, this plane right now has the ground gravel um, substance in it and so not only does it have all the regular things that we're looking at but it also has these other gravel scale, gravel layers, gravel amounts a bunch of other settings that are all part of this substance. Now these are uh, really powerful ideas. This means that uh, suddenly somebody has built not only a material that can be applied to objects but suddenly everything from hue shift to the gravel amount can be adjusted um, on the fly um, by an artist inside of the game engine. All of these kind of substances built that we can use in Unity or Unreal uh, or Substance Painter are built inside of Substance Designer. I'm using Substance Designer 2018. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about uh, how the basics of this uh, works before we get going. Now to get going in Substance Designer, first thing we'll want to do is create a new substance. Uh, when we do this it will ask uh, what we want the graph name to be. I'm going to call this uh, Diamond Plated Metal. Uh, and I'm going to use the physically based metallic roughness. This is the default standard setting inside of Unity. Unreal or UE4 only uses metallic roughness so this is a good one to kind of begin with. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and click on OK at this point. Now what will happen here is that there will be several things that start to pop up. One is up here at the top we can start to see the different output nodes that are used in this material. You'll see this unsaved package with this material, diamond plated uh, metal set here. And then you'll see a 2D image and a 3D image. Uh, now the 3D uh, version that we're using down here I can left uh, drag to uh, to um, to tumble around. Um, if I right mouse drag up and down I can zoom and if I middle mouse drag uh, then I can pan. Up here at the top this works the same way. Middle mouse drag allows me to pan um, and then if I uh, alt right mouse drag then I can zoom in and out. Now if you look here um, inside of here you're going to see that here's our outputs that include things that we would expect base color, normal, roughness, metallic, and height. Um, what uh, Substance Designer really is, is it's going to allow us to work much like the Hypershade in uh, Maya uh, or the Material Editor in Unreal or the new Material Editor in Unity 2018 to allow us to start to create nodes that are be able to be tied together inputs and outputs to define the different attributes um, that are available. The way that this node editor up here will work is that uh, whenever any particular node is selected we'll see over here on the right the particular attributes of that node we'll see its visual indication in 2D here and its 3D and then all of that together will uh, reveal the 3D space uh, over here on the left. So the way that Substance Designer starts to put all this stuff together is uh, there are actually several places to get nodes from. There's a collection of them that are available here at the top, some icons here. There's a large collection of them here in the library and if you hold the space uh, the space bar down or click the space bar then you'll be able to see a bunch of them here uh, that you can select. So uh, for instance you can choose to do just a color uh, and what that will do is bring up this color node. Now the thing to remember is uh, just like in uh, the hypershade what it's got is an output 
on the right and inputs on the left. Um, so in this case uh, I could tie the color of this into the base color here uh, if I needed to. I can select any connection and delete it or select any node uh, and delete them as well. Now there's some fairly simple ones like uh, just tying in the color but there's also some that are a little bit more sophisticated. So for instance if we look over here in the library and I want to start to make this look like a, a metal I can come down and there's a series of material filters including some PBR utilities. Um, one of the ones that uh, works really well is this uh, PBR metal reflection or PBR base color. I'm going to go ahead and just bring in this metal reflection uh, into this into the space here. Uh, what will happen here is that if I grab click and drag from the middle color out to the base color here then suddenly it's using this node to define the color of the base color. We'll see it here and then we see it out here. It's important to note that a lot of these nodes, especially the ones out of the library, sometimes are a large collection of nodes themselves. So for instance, if I'm looking at this PBR metal reflection node, if I come down and open the reference, tell it to go ahead and open it, you'll see that we've got this new SBS. This is a new package um, that uh, that's available uh, that we've built. And actually if we start to click on this, then we'll see that this actually has its own collection of things that if I come in and edit this, you can see that it's actually quite a bit of complex collection of things. Now. I don't want to get into he that here, so I'm going to go ahead and close that, come back to our regular uh, material so we can see it. But sometimes you just need to understand that when we're looking at nodes, sometimes the nodes themselves are quite a collection of nested nodes. Now for us, this node becomes important because as I actually click on this node, this PBR metal reflection, and it highlights over here uh, in our properties, then we can see that there's some instance parameters. So for instance, I can come in and say, look, I want to deal with iron because I'm going to be making a diamond plated shape. Um, if you start to use any of these, these are just a lot of kind of pre-built presets uh, that give you a good place to start. Uh, so in our case, I'm going to go ahead and begin with iron. So now that we've got this kind of basic metal set up there, the metal color is good, but this still starts to read really, really plasticky. And part of what we want to do is make sure that we're controlling all of the channels. So we've got base color, normal, uh, roughness, and metallic. The metallic is the next one that we're going to want to control to start to make this, well, look like metal. Um, so what I'm going to do is press and hold the space bar here, and I'm going to create something called uniform color. Basically, this is one of the simplest nodes, uh, and what it is is just a, a solid color. So if we look at this color, we can see it. Uh, it's 2D result here. It doesn't do anything in the 3D because it's not plugged in. We can also look and see over here on the side the specific parameters that are available here. So for instance, since this is metallic, we're going to want to be working with grayscale. So I'll go ahead and plug uh, these two in here so that uh, uh, this uniform color node is actually controlling, controlling the metallic settings. And then I can come in and say, look, I want this to be closer to white so that as I move that metallic setting over there, then suddenly we start to get uh, real metallic output. Now there is a little bit of something goofy here that we need to make sure and take care of. Uh, that is, if we start to look at this closely, then we're going to see some kind of strange um, artifacting that's happening there on the corners. The re this is a uh, because we don't have our normal setup. Uh, so early on, we'll want to make sure and set this up here. I'm going to come up to my normal channel, which doesn't have any input. I'm going to press the space bar and just type in normal. Uh, and then make sure that I tie even this blank normal um, to that edge and usually that can help uh, solve much of the problems that uh, we'll have. Later on we're going to plug in uh, more details there. Um, but that gets us started uh, with uh, a reasonable actually facsimile of a fairly metallic surface. Continuing on with making this looking metal, we need to also define the roughness, metallic roughness. Uh, almost all the game engines work with those uh, as a combination. So right now where I've got the roughness uh, with also not having any input, I can either make a new uh, uniform color node or I can copy and paste that particular node as well. I'm going to tie those two in together. Uh, that completely white, suddenly this becomes uh, completely rough so all the reflections are very, very diffuse. Uh, but if I start to kind of pull that back, then I can start to um, decide how rough uh, or not I actually want those reflections to be. Now remember, uh, we've solved some of the problems because we took care of this normals here, but notice that if I get rid of that here, then we have those problems there. Making sure that you always have a normals input there will help um, solve a lot of that. But again, here the idea is that we can um, have absolute control over what that metallic 
uh, looks like, uh, how rough it's going to appear, how metallic it's going to appear, what the reflections are going to look like. So we've got a good start on the metal, but it still doesn't uh, feel very interesting. Uh, kind of uh, fuzzy chrome or something. What we want to do is come in and make some adjustments to the roughness so we can uh, make this uh, more interesting. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this mode, uh, this node out a little bit and there's several ways that we can kind of put something in the middle here which is what we're going to do. Uh, I'm going to come over here onto the uh, into our library and I want to look for a collection of noises um, that we can work with and I can start to just search by different things so let's say we're going to grab a grunge. Wes McDermott likes uh, this uh, grunge 12 uh, so I can come and drag this uh, this node into our space so that we're set to go. So the plan here is that I want to get rid of this controller, uh, this solid color. Uh, so I'll go ahead and just uh, delete that connection here and instead plug in this new grunge map. Now what this will do is uh, you'll see immediately how this is kind of set up um, and that there's there are some things that we can start to do uh, as we play with that. For instance, we can play with the contrast um, of this as we in, uh, change the contrast of this, then it will change how this works. Um, higher contrast, then you can see how that all works out. We can invert um, this uh, however we need, uh, even kind of play with the play with the balance. This oftentimes is a pretty easy way to start to work with it. Um, there are some other ways that we can uh, further define that uh, if we want to. For instance, one of them is to use a level controller as though we were using Photoshop. What I'm going to do is I'm going to select the connection. Um, this is another way you can import stuff automatically. And I'm going to hit the space bar and just type in levels uh, and I can start to place that. And you see how it automatically ties all of that stuff in. What this means is that now if I want to, I can come in and start to adjust uh, the levels of the output um, if I want to, to control how that works. Uh, or I could work with the levels of the input as well, uh, depending on uh, what I'm after here. Um, but both of those allow me to have a little bit more control over how that, um, that particular grunge map is going to control um, what happens on that surface. But we can see this is starting to feel like a much more interesting metallic surface. Once you start working a lot with reflections um, and roughness, it's probably time that you look a little bit at uh, what's happening with the environment as this makes a big difference. Uh, if you hold the control shift down, then you can rotate that environment around, um, or you can choose whether or not you're actually going to see it um, at all. So for instance, uh, I can come here and make sure that I can see um, what's actually happening there. I can also come in and as you look over into the library, then among the other things that are here are things like uh, this environment map. So for instance, I can come in and choose uh, to swap out uh, for different environment, environment maps, uh, whichever ones I want to try. And of course, these uh, will all change the, uh, the effect of the lighting um, as it uh, moves through the space. So um, this is the one we're using in our last demo, the glazed patio, so you can see what's happening there. And as soon as you start to do this, then you might find that you want to actually make some adjustments um, to how uh, your levels are set up so that you can get the kind of look that you're after. All right, so on to the next step where we can uh, do more. I'm going to actually turn off my environment here for a second um, so that we're, I tend to like being able to just see the surface without the environment there. Uh, but we can start to move on to the next chunk where we can start to work with our normal maps. So now it's time to start to make this look really like that diamond plated surface. Um, we're going to do this in our normals area. Uh, and so right now we've got our uh, normal output just with the normal input um, uh, node that's available here. There are a large collection of different things that we can use. We can bring in our own stuff, uh, but over here we're going to look for the patterns, and there's a pattern in here that actually looks a lot like uh, diamond plated materials, so this mesh one. So I'm just going to drag this up, uh, put it into place. Now right now it's black and white, so this is closer to a bump map or a height map, and what we really want it to be is a normal map. So what this normal node will do is when I plug these in together, then it converts the information of this height map into a normal map that can then be uh, used as a normal. Now, with this node um, connected then, or, or uh, selected, I can choose to rotate it 45 degrees, I can choose how many tiles it's going to have, um, so we can start to see the results of uh, what that's going to look like. Now, that 
isn't quite looking like what we want. I might come into the normal map, uh, to the normal node here. I'm going to turn the intensity way up so that I can see that a little bit more here. Maybe I'll increase the uh, tiling there a little bit. And here I can move that up to 3. I notice this is set to 3. I can actually manually come in and if I double click on that value I can manually enter a value above 3. Uh, let's say 6 or 4 or whatever I want. Um, so that I can, I'm actually not trapped with that uh, one, two, or three. Now, <clears throat> this is a good start, um, but uh, those diamond plate plated surfaces are usually much crisper on the edge. Um, so what I want to do is start to take a little bit more control over this particular image, so that it's not so much grayscale that's happening there. Um, so to do this, we've already looked at this kind of idea before. I'm going to slide this over here. I'm going to select the connection, press the space bar, and bring in levels so that it brings the levels um, setting right inside of there. And then, then I can start to adjust the levels, the inputs on that, so that we have less grays. It makes the blacks blacker and the whites whiter. Um, so I can start to get a little bit closer to what um, that diamond plated um, surface actually should look like. So in a hurry, we started to create um, this uh, fairly simple uh, graph graph here. I don't need this color anymore. Uh, that has a metallic look with some roughness control that gives a little bit of uh, changes in it. And we've controlled the normal map uh, to create the surface. Next thing we want to start to do is start to add some rust um, into this so that it's not quite so clean. So we can go ahead and put it in our sewer. Okay, so to start with the rust, we're going to start working with a variety of different nodes. A lot of these nodes are not necessarily intuitive, and you wouldn't know about them until you see somebody use them. This is kind of the fun part about Substance Designers. There's always new things to be able to discover. So we're going to start working with a collection of nodes that will allow us to change the color. Later, we're going to use it to plug into all sorts of things. Uh, but we're going to start working uh, with some rust. So the first thing I'm going to do is come down over here and grab uh, some noise um, that we want. Uh, Wes McDermott in his demo uses this black and white spots, which is a great one. Um, and he's going to use this as kind of the baseline to create um, the uh, the rust. Now, the problem is is that this is just kind of black and white here. It maybe not have quite the rust that we want. There's uh, an interesting node uh, called directional warp. So I just hit the space bar and I typed in directional warp. Um, with this directional warp, what I can do is I can plug this into uh, both the input and the intensity input. And then as this directional warp, I can do things like change uh, the direction that this is going to actually rotate along. So maybe uh, straight down like this and I can start to increase that intensity so maybe I'll even double click in here and say look I want that to be 40 uh, or even no, I don't know 60 All right, so we start to see this particular noise pattern uh, suddenly becoming an entirely different pattern altogether now, this is pretty typical of uh, how a designer wants you to think is be able to take any sort of input start to manipulate it maybe manipulate it again before it finally ends up uh, in where you're th where you're thinking of it uh, of it being so the idea here now is that we've got a pattern but we need to colorize this so that it works uh, more like rust um, so what, what we could do is we could just use a regular color but an even better is to make a gradient map um, so I'm going to press the space bar here and start to type in gradient map it's actually the first one set there uh, so this will start to be set up now I want to make sure that this as the output is tied to this as the input and then this will later be tied into the color but this gradient map right now is just uh, grayscale now this is one of my favorite parts of uh, uh, substance designer is that with that gradient map node selected if you look over here there's actually this excellent gradient editor tool um, what happens here is if I click on this gradient editor tool I could come in and manually pick um, the colors that I wanted or you can actually use this pick gradient tool and I'm going to make sure just so that we can see it here on the screen I'm going to come and pick the gradient that I like oh look there's a rusted uh, diamond plate but let's find one that's got some good colors let's say uh, let's say this one uh, so I can actually see uh, this image pretty pretty easily and so uh, what I'll do is make this a little bit smaller it's a little bit easier if you're not capturing on screen but let's just slide this over here like this uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the pick gradient 
Uh, and then what you can do is come and just draw a line and what it does is it samples the colors that you draw across there and that's what it uses to create that so for instance I can come and say well I kinda want a darker collection so maybe through there uh, or I don't know I'm just gonna kind of pick a variety of these different ones until I find the uh, what I'm after I think I like the the darker stuff right there um, so I've sampled um, the that rusty surface and it's created this really complex collection of gradients um, that's all set up there and that's actually what becomes my rusty gradient really a powerful idea okay so now we've got our rust uh, at least our series of stuff that's going to be our rust but we also have our base color here so I'm just gonna reorganize this stuff a little bit visually so we've got the rust we've got the base color right now that base um, color that metallic um, uh, node is defining all of what's happening what we really want to have happen is a blending um, between these two so what we'll do is there's actually a tool a node called blend so I'm going to hit the spacebar called blend bring that in now this blend node has got several things here it's got a foreground a background opacity and then of course the output so what we're going to want to do of course is let's get rid of that I'm going to want to put the output of the blend into our color and then um, we're going to tie the rust as the foreground uh, that's sitting over the top of the background um, that's that's set there, uh, which is the the metal. Now, if I click on this blend, you'll see that there's this opacity, and as I slide this, then it blends from one um, to the other, which isn't um, which is easy to understand, but not particularly engaging down here. What we really want to make use of is this opacity input, which works much like a mask. Uh, if we were working in Photoshop. So here let me uh, make a little bit more space here. I'm just going to grab all these nodes and kind of slide them up here. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the same um, method that I did here to create a new mask um, that will be really organic to make that work. So I'm going to select these, uh, I'm going to copy and paste those, I'm just going to set these down here. Now I don't want to use this exactly the same way because if I use these exact same nodes um, to plug that in then suddenly every place that we were dark here, all that yellow will always be gone. Instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in um, to this uh, node and there's actually a random seed. And the idea with a random seed is that you can actually change that around so that it uh, looks a little bit different. Um, let's uh, wonder why we're not getting an update there. Um, let's go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and let's plug this into the opacity here and see what we get. Okay, so I don't know why that wasn't updating, but uh, but let's do that. Okay, now this is not bad, right? We can start to see how this is working out, but let's uh, take a little bit more control over that still. So in this case, we took the direct the results of the directional warp um, and we ran it through a gradient mask. Uh, let's come in and uh, we can use either a levels um, or if we're still using the same things that we've done in um, uh, Photoshop, is let's bring in a histogram scan. Uh, and so this works uh, just like a, a histogram would. Um, the cool thing about the histogram here is if we start to um, double click this, come on, histogram. Just not seeing that. Okay, there we go. Then we can come down to the parameters and we can play with the position, we can play with the contrast. It's a really pretty easy way to start to work with that. And so now I'm going to come and put the output of that into the input of the opacity here. Uh, maybe this will be a little bit easier to see there. So what's happening is this is the top, this is the uh, uh, bottom, and then this is being used to add, uh, to define um, where that rest shows up on top of that. Now it's kind of cool because we can still come into that histogram scan, for instance, and as I adjust that position, then I can essentially control how much rust is actually going to show up um, on that surface, which can be a really powerful thing later because we can expose that so that we can adjust that uh, once we get it into the game engine. So there's some good things that are happening here. Uh, I really like uh, that we're able to start to get uh, this uh, fairly realistic um, rust going on there. I don't like that it's just kind of randomly kind of gathered around. I'd really like to have it so that maybe it was rusting around these edges where um, moisture would actually collect and I think that would work uh, much much more believably. Uh, so what I want to do is start to use some of the other information that we ha we have uh, to create this. Uh, so for instance um, right here I've already got this setup here where I'm actually building um, this sort of uh, information uh, that I have 
that I know where the, the different lumps are. Um, so what I'm going to do is build a small sequence of nodes. One is called um, Curvature Smooth. Um, what this will do is, let's go ahead and bring that there. I'm going to plug this into here. Curvature Smooth, now we can start to see um, a grayscale version uh, of, of what we've got there. And then I'm also going to come in and create another, oops, another Levels um, node. Uh, and go ahead and connect those two together there. Now the levels node, what I want to do is this is going to be a mask, so I'm going to swap these two like this. Uh, and what this will start to allow me to do is that as I start to tighten this stuff up here a little bit, let's look at this a little bit closer. <clears throat> then you start to see uh, the uh, the white, this kind of white halo there. That means that this is going to be where the rust is most likely going to show up. It won't show up on the top of these as much. We'll have a little bit there, maybe in the middle, and maybe we might uh, adjust this a little bit um, so that we get a little bit more white in the middle there. Um, but this will start to allow us to collect uh, rest where we want it to be. Now, what we've got here, though, now is so all of this stuff is still involved uh, in this channel uh, and this uh, functionality here, but we're going to want to be able to start to tie all of this into the mask. So I'm going to uh, do a little bit of reorganizing here to get this worked out. One, I'm going to uh, break this connection here because I want to do some uh, connection there. Two, I'm going to use this histogram in a little bit different place because I wanted to do is take this and this, blend them together to create the opacity, but along the way I want to be able to control that histogram. So um, to do this, let's go ahead and uh, organize this just a little bit differently. I'm going to go ahead and bring all this stuff up here. Let's make sure and have this stuff set up here. Then I'm going to uh, create a blend node. That blend node will have, um, oops, had the wrong thing selected. Let's make sure nothing's selected. Uh, let's create a blend node here. Um, the idea here is that I'll go ahead and let uh, this be the foreground, I'll let this be the background. Um, those will be set up there. In this blend node, I'm going to tell this not to use copy, but instead to use add. And so what we can start to do is see how it's adding the uh, what we've got up here to what we've got down here. And then finally, I'll plug this into the histogram. And uh, by plugging this into the histogram, then with the histogram scan, then I can start to do things like adjust uh, the position so I can control how much rust there is, the contrast so I can start to control that same sort of thing as I need to. Uh, and then this is what I will actually plug in uh, to the opacity. So again, this is still going to be uh, my controller that allows me to control how much rust um, there is on the surface. But what will happen here is now if we start to look at this, you'll start to see how rust is collecting around the edges here, uh, which is a great thing, um, kind of what, what we're after. Now, um, while we're at it, I'm going to, to double, uh, double click out here um, so you can see that the uh, that our resolution is set to 512 by 512. Uh, maybe what I'll do um, right now is let's go ahead and move that up to uh, 2048 by 2048. Um, this is probably bigger than we want uh, eventually, but you can start to see how that starts to, uh, for illustration's sake, starts to make that a lot clearer. So again, we can control uh, the amount of rust uh, with this selection right here, and so we can start to dial that up and down, but we're getting a much more sophisticated uh, application of that rust across that surface, so it's intelligent as far as understanding how that surface should work. All right, so the last thing we're going to do here before we uh, go ahead and export this is um, so far we've used this kind of collection, this particular generator here, to generate um, not only our normal that we can see here, but it's going through this chain to help to de uh, define where stuff is rusty. But we also probably want to make sure that we're using this to define roughness, uh, to, I'm sorry, metallic. Um, because right now uh, everything is just solid white for the metallic, which means that the rust, which should be more matte, uh, is being as glossy as everything else. Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm just going to move my metallic um, up here. I'm going to delete this uh, connection here and get rid of it. And then what I want to do is I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to plug this into the metallic. However, uh, in this case, uh, what's happening is the white, which is the rust, uh, would be the stuff that was really shiny and we want it to be just opposite of that. Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, str again straight out of this histogram um, setting here is I'm going to create a new uh, invert uh, grayscale node. 
Um, this invert grayscale node will allow me to then bring this as an output and tie that into the metallic. And so what that will allow this to ha have happen is that the parts that are metal will show up as uh, as metallic or more specular glossy, and the parts that are rusty will be more dielectric, so they'll be uh, more matte. I can still tie in the height um, uh, if I wanted to. In fact, uh, why don't we do that really quick? Uh, what I'll just do is I'm going to grab uh, this node right here, tie it down into our height, um, so that that's set there, uh, just so that I've got that available um, later if uh, if I need it. Okay, so the last thing I want to add here is uh, start to work with some ambient occlusion. So, so far we have outputs that include our uh, color, our uh, height, our normal, our roughness, metallic. Uh, we've already built the height in. So, in this case, we want to create a new output uh, that we're going to use uh, for our ambient occlusion. So, I'm going to come down here, click once in an empty space, uh, and create a new output uh, node. This new output node, I can then choose what the usage is going to be. So, I'll click on the Add Item. Here, uh, I'll select Ambient Occlusion. I'm going to copy these terms and put it actually in the identifier. Uh, in the uh, description we can start to set up other things, so maybe in the label I'll just type in ambient ambient uh, occlusion um, so that it has it, it's all pretty easy to use. So it's going to be using this actually as the node for ambient occlusion. So uh, to do this I already have some information that already describes this. So for instance I'm going to come and grab essentially this height map that I have here and plug it into the ambient occlusion um, here. Now I might choose to actually do some other uh, kinds of adjustments here. Well, in fact, that actually won't work because I haven't actually built the ambient occlusion node. So let me uh, go ahead and bring in the uh, uh, ambient occlusion node. Um, this node, then I'll go ahead and plug this into there, plug this into there. Um, so we've got that set up. Now sometimes you'll notice that nothing new seems to happen. If I right click on, an, if you're seeing things that don't change, then right click in an empty space and view outputs in 3D view and so, and that will um, change things um, fairly quickly. Um, so you can start to see how that's working out. I can come back into this ambient um, node and I can start to kind of change maybe this radius down a little bit, kind of settle it down a little bit. Let's uh, uh, update that a little bit. Uh, maybe work with my height here a little bit so that we can start to see I'm getting a little bit of ambient occlusion in there, uh, but not too much. All right, so now with all of that set up with an ambient occlusion, height, roughness, normal, uh, metallic, and color, I'm ready to finally output this. Again, we want to make sure that we save the file, um, save all so that we've got both the SPS and we've got our new material, and we're ready to start the process of outputting the file. Okay, so now that we're ready to start looking at exporting this, uh, I wanted to look at the idea of being able to uh, exposing a parameter so that we can use it. We've already looked uh, at some examples, for instance, inside of Unity when we're looking at this, there's things like gravel amount um, that we can adjust. Uh, in this uh, version that we've built so far, we already have uh, this kind of cool histogram scan that we can use to uh, essentially control, using the position, how much rust there is on the space. It'd be really nice if we could ex actually expose that so so anybody using this material, either in Substance Painter uh, or Unity or Unreal, could have access to this. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and grab that uh, that histogram scan. I'm going to come here into the position, which allows us to control that, and I'm going to click down on the expose. Looks like we just captured that on the uh, on our uh, video here. So uh, you can either use the default position, which isn't very descriptive, or I can come and create a new one, which in this case I'm going to call rest amount and go ahead and click on OK. Click on OK again. Now you'll notice that what happens is now in the histogram uh, that position slider is gone, um, but what it does mean though is that I will have uh, out here if I click on my metal plated material uh, we'll be able to see this uh, in new places we will have a new um, rust slider. There's a whole bunch of things that are happening over here but let's uh, kind of pull some of these down you'll see that there's new this new input parameter and inside that new input parameter is this our new rust amount um, and suddenly this uh, this will allow us to do all sorts of things um, if we want to start to play with uh, what that rust is and this is where we can adjust it here we can adjust it in substance designer and we can adjust it in unity
Before we can export this, we want to make sure that we've done a few things with um, the base parameters of the substance. So I'm going to come back and double click on any empty space here. Up here on our output, output size here, it's important that we change this to relative to the parent and that this is indeed set to parent times one. If we don't have this set up uh, correctly here, then uh, we're, we're, we're going to be uh, have errors thrown uh, when we output. All right, once we've got all that set up, I'm going to make sure and save uh, save what I've got uh, uh, to make sure I've got everything saved. And then if you click right here uh, on either the SPS or the metal, um, if you come up here to the top, there's a number of different buttons, including the ability to publish um, the selected element. So in this case, I want to go ahead and publish this. So I'll publish that selected element uh, into my desktop, uh, Substance Designer Demo, uh, Diamond Plated Metal, notice that this is exporting as an SBSAR, a substance um, archive. Um, this we can then start to decide how whatever we want to have here. This all should be fine. I'm going to go ahead and click on OK uh, to output that and then we're ready to go. Now what I can do is that uh, if I were to go and look uh, at uh, um, at this, I can look at the desktop and our uh, substance designer demo. Here's that uh, that uh, here's the the file that I've been working with, Substance Designer, which I want to keep. But here's that archive that suddenly I can use in other applications. So, uh, for instance, if I want to, I uh, could come into uh, Substance um, Painter, um, and I could start to do things like import um, things. So I could add a resource, uh, Substance to Designer Demo, and I could bring in that SBAR. Go ahead and import it. Um, tell it that I want it to be a material, a base material. Uh, and just I can either do a current session or to this project, and I go ahead and import it, and then here I've got this new uh, this new material. Uh, so if I wanted to, uh, I don't know why I would want to, but uh, let's look at uh, just his torso, for instance. Uh, and I'm going to bring this up uh, as a as a fill layer here, and there it is, right? Um, so I can look at this diamond plated material. Um, down here, and here's my rust amount, right? So I can start to play with how much rust is on there. So I built my own uh, my own stuff there. Or uh, if I'm using Unity, for instance, um, if I wanted to, I could uh, come and grab hold of that SBAR. I'm just going to import it by dragging it into the Unity project um, so that it's set there. And then here's my diamond plated material. So I can grab that material, drag it right onto anything that I want. I'm set to go. I could adjust that plane, let's say, uh, change the tiling to 10 by 10 uh, or uh, even 30 by 30 um, to start to get that uh, how I wanted to. Play with all sorts of things here. For instance, I can move, uh, play with that height map, get it higher or lower so that it makes more sense. It's actually still probably too big, so let's do a 50 by 50. Um, pretty easy. And you'll see that there's our rust amount, right? There's the stuff that we built, so I can turn that rust amount down or turn that rust amount up however I need to have, have that set up. So now I've got that SBAR that I can use however I want. I can go back and rebuild this if I need and re-export uh, as I need to. Anyway, hope this has been helpful. That's all for now. Thanks.